it's a real thrill for me uh, uh, to have pushed my flight till tomorrow to stay here <laughs> and, uh, and moderate uh, uh, <laughs> this panel after this movie. I, I, I saw this movie, I've seen it twice now, and I, I, it's my, easily my favorite movie of the year, and I think it's just incredible. I, I, it has... Hold for applause. I, one thing that I think my, one of my favorite things in a movie is the, when watching a movie is that feeling that anything can happen at any time, but at the same time that, that you feel like you're in safe hands because when you don't feel that, you hate the director, but when you feel in safe hands, you love it because it's so pleasurable. But at the same time, I'm, I, I don't think I've sweat actually in a movie since I was a kid <laughs> as much as I did in this movie. Um, so um, I, I guess my first question um, uh, uh, for, for Joel and Ethan is, um, mine riding bitch. <laughs> Was that in the novel, or did you guys come up with that? No, we added that. Um, Ethan added that. He's, oh, he's got a very vulgar mouth. <laughs> <laughs> And bitch is sitting in the middle, right? It's on the right, yeah. Right, and bitch is okay. sitting in the middle, yeah. Um, How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, felt we'd you know earned the writing fee adding those three words. <laughs> I found the one line you added. <laughs> um, can you guys talk a little bit, of sort of just about? your method of adaptation, I mean, in terms of... Yeah, actually, Ethan described it very well recently. How Someone asked us how we collaborate on a, the two of us on an adaptation. He said, one of us sits at the word processor while the other holds the spine of the book open so the <laughs> person can read it. While they're <laughs> That's why, you know, it's harder if you're not a team. No, I know, I know. <laughs> I thought I was going to learn something helpful. <laughs> um, um, do you go through it and underline, and then before one of you is holding the spine, have you underlined, uh, or do you, are you just going, you're just flying through it first time through? Pretty much. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, yeah. it's it's a fairly faithful. I, I mean, we didn't diverge from the the book. We didn't. You know, it's it's pretty straight on. So. We pretty much started at the beginning and plowed our way through. Was there was there anything that you loved in the book that that you felt was in some ways that it was just too literary to translate that that you wanted to keep but couldn't figure out a way to do it? Too literary. I don't know about or that. Internal well, or internal? Well, internally, yeah, wait, right. The book is every other chapter virtually is interior monologues of the sheriff character, the Tommy Lee Jones character, um, and they're very. Not only are they just in inter internal monologues, they're very digressive. They don't have anything to do with the plot of the story. So I don't know if, that, uh, if that's literary per se, but it was a, a feature of the book that we kind of had to confront. We, the first thing we had to kind of face is, what do we do with this? It's you know, almost half the book. Right. And, and did, is there anything you can cite that, that in the movie that sort of you found a sort of cinematic equivalent of something that was that you sort of translated that that you can cite in the movie? <laughs> no, basically we dumped it. <laughs> Good uh, we preserved a little of it in dramatic context. Yeah, some of that some of that material we put in in Tommy's mouth in scenes between him and, and the deputy Garrett Delahunt, and a little bit the, the, of course the monologue at the end, uh, which is in a scene with his wife. Um, but you know most of that we we just kind of it got lost. And do you switch off typing, uh, uh, both you guys are? I know you don't use Final Draft. Um, no. So how many tabs to get to the character? This is the Writer's Guild. No, that's two. true. It, uh, it's right. Two tabs. Yeah, establishing that sort of macro on the computer in order to sort of, you know, conform the sort of internal dialogue margins is a big part of adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did, did doing, you know, an adaptation, did it free you up in ways that, that was surprising to you or that, I mean, than if something that you had originated? I mean, as directors or? 
writers? Um, uh, I don't know that it, it freed us up. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's, you have the whole template there sort of to follow, obviously, it was very different from writing an original screenplay. Um, and um, it is true that in a certain respect, I mean, especially in the respect of writing, you know, that Netta, doing this sort of thing is, feels very different from, from doing your own story. It didn't feel any different. The process of actually making the movie didn't feel any different, I have to say. Um, but all, for all the obvious reasons in terms of, uh, you know, doing an adaptation as opposed to sort of doing an original screenplay, that, you know, the writing was different. Um, I don't know that it was, it's, um, no, I don't think it's more freeing. I mean, in fact, you're, it's, it's in a way, it's the opposite. You're sort of following a plan. Right. And you don't want to violate sort of what the book is. Not, not to the extent that it's, you've sort of taken that, the, you know, which we had in this case, taken the sort of fundamental nature of the book in terms of its structure and its characters and, and, and how the story progressed and weren't, we weren't interested in, in doing any real variation from that. There's, it's, there's something about the movie I find it's so pleasurable and there's something so, I, I mean, I was so riveted seeing it that I feel like even though I ostensibly as a writer director understand movie magic, I kind of like, this in watching it, it's sort of, I almost want to know how you did all the most minute things. Um, but I, I, I'll just pick like a, one that I, in some ways when I was watching the movie that sort of kicked it off is the streaks um, of Javier's shoes on the floor when he gets out of the cuffs. And he's, is that something that you guys, was that in the script or did you, when you came to shot listing, did you, or storyboarding, did you bring it in or what sort of, I mean, it's a minor thing, but in a way it feels like, it's like that detail is so creepy. And in some ways, for me, set the tone of the movie. Well, it was totally accidental. We, in fact, on the set, when I, because there were kind of new shoes, uh, it was leaving those marks on the floor, and we we were kind of upset about it because obviously it presented continuity problems. Right. Um, so we were kind of pissed off about it, and then we thought, well, it's there. We can't really clean it off, so we decided to pretend it was, a, you know, make a virtue of it, and we we did the shot did looking the shot down up. on the streaks with the boots, but um, we actually had to we had to clean up earlier takes in the sequence with a, in the computer um, in order to make the sort of continuity of that work. But interestingly, it was one of the only things Cormac said after he saw the movie was he commented on particularly liking that as well. Yes. <laughs> That's interesting. Because I was even wondering if it was in the book, you could almost hear it, imagine him describing the shoe streaks. But it is, uh, see, that's the kind of stuff I like to know. That's well, he did describe they, in the book in detail what happens with the victim's feet as he's sort of, you know, kicking the floor and knocking things over. That's true. Um, uh, Joel, I, you, you, I know that Kurosawa, you're a big admirer of, and, and, I, and I know Ethan um, is, is very interested in, Films that involve Jodie Foster trapped in a confined <laughs> space, uh, like a panic yeah, room or an airplane. Yeah. Flight yeah. plane. Um, could you, Excellent could you, pictures. Joel and Ethan Cohen, talk about how those uh, two influences meshed in No Country for Old Men? Um, well, it's interesting because when we were kids, we used to watch something on TV called the Mel Jazz Matinee Movie, and what he did basically was purchase the whole Joseph E. Levine library. So one day it would be eight and a half, and the next day it would be the Sons of Hercules. And we didn't really, we liked both of those as well. Um, it was a um, sort of object lesson in the appreciation of different kinds of cinema. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's never late on the set. I thought people were uh, applauding Mel oh, Jazz yes, for a minute. It's puzzling. 
Uh, Josh, could you talk a little bit about the scene where you're running from the dog? <laughs> um, just, uh, it's another scene, I mean, there's something both so incredibly hilarious about that scene and also incredibly frightening, which I think is sort of true of the whole movie. The, uh, just, uh, also, was that a real dog? That, uh, and it was an untrained dog, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and then the Coens would be kind of on the sidelines where the camera was laughing and chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> No, but we went through that scene for a week. I mean, Roger Deakins only kind of allowed shooting for an hour and a half in the morning from like 4 to 5.30 in the morning and between 5.30 and 7 at night just to get the light just right. And he did such an amazing job, you know, in how he made it look, for sure. <laughs> but no, working with the dog was awful, man. It sucked. And I had a broken collarbone on top of it. And I don't know. It's just a whole kind of torture experience with, <laughs> with the Coens. It's a very personal thing for them. <laughs> so no, Noah. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Kelly, in the, the, your scene, uh, it's sort of your final scene where you are faced with Shigeru and, and, and the, the, the well, probably what I love about that scene is almost you're almost cranky about being having to die in a way. I mean, <laughs> like now this, um, and there's like this amazing stillness on your part. I, I, I again, I'm sort of am asking a lot of sort of the naive questions, but I, I feel like, were you, like how scared did you really feel actually playing that? Um, well, strangely, before we had even gone for a rehearsal. There was a very, it was a really relaxed atmosphere on set that day, really particularly relaxed, I thought. So much so that um, <laughs> Joel and Ethan were making a lot of noise. They were laughing with the makeup artist, Jean Black. And uh, the AD was too scared to say to the directors, could you leave the building, please? You're disturbing Roger Deakins. And so they asked me to leave, and I had to go and stand in the corner. <laughs> I remember you telling me And it was that. you guys. And so it wasn't like, there wasn't, a, a, you know, this big sort of feeling, you know, this big ominous thing was about to happen. But um, all it took was just opening the bedroom door, that first rehearsal, and just seeing um, Javier sitting in that chair. And it, it was just so, it, he was just so evil. It was just <laughs> there. And um, so I, I was sort of scared and... All the right ways. It was. It was. I don't know. <laughs> you know it's a great. It's just because it, there's almost like resignation with fear, and like I said, and al almost an irritability, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of. Well, she's kind of not. You know, she knows what's going to happen. Yeah, she, yeah, um, she knows. She knows what her fate is, and she also knows there's nothing she can do about it. So it's that kind of attitude of like, I'm not going to play a game <laughs> now. It's just like get it, get it done in a normal fashion. <laughs> <laughs> and Javier, do you, when you're playing evil incarnate, do you um, do you create a backstory for that character? I mean, do you think about his childhood? Born in hell. <laughs> um, or do you just play the moment? Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, not really. I don't think there is a backstory of that guy because I uh, know in, in the book also there's no backstory, so I just pretend to know the backstory and, <laughs> and, and go there and try to uh, make them believe that I know the backstory. <laughs> <laughs> and then go out there and kill people and put my scary faces. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. That actually explains the crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, why don't we, we open up to questions and see what uh, people have to say. My question is about Act 3, no. when you switch protagonists. And here we were following Josh and really wanting to have a showdown with the bad guy, and we never got that. And I wonder, it must be the way it was in the book, but can you explain why we didn't get to see an on-screen confrontation between him and the bad guy, and why do you suddenly switch to another main character? Question to who? I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess to uh, the, the writer directors. Well, it is from the book. I mean, you know, it's, it's from the book is the short answer. Uh, but it's part of what we liked about the book. It is kind of uh, 
Oh, he, it's shocking in the book as well that the Josh's character, who seems to be kind of the main guy, gets killed off stage, as it were, in the book, and not even by the bad guy, whom he doesn't even get to meet, but by some nameless schmoes. Um, but I, you know, I, well, bah, why is that, or why did that appeal to us? It's like kind of, it's, yeah, although it's kind of shocking and unconventional. Especially in a movie, maybe even more so than a novel, it seems you know it's connected to what the story is about, which is, uh, you know, I, the world is a horrible, uh, unforgiving, and capricious place, and it doesn't you know conform to one's expectations or certainly you know genre conventions, and that's you know. And also, we've heard of the reaction of this character, you know, especially when he meets. You know, in the book, there's this character that he picks up, and I don't know how many people have read the book, but, you know, that character at the pool goes on for um, some time, and they chose not to use that in the, in the movie. But at least for Moss, you know, you believe at that moment, especially when he smiles, it's one of the first times you see him smile, and you actually have all this hope that he's going to actually prevail in this situation. And you rape, basically, the audience of that experience of a showdown, which, you know, is fairly formulaic. And you get to experience what violence truly is, which is a sudden, you know, uh, subtraction of somebody. And I haven't seen that in film. I think that's extremely unique and risky. And the more that people react to that moment, the more effective I think it was. I think the more of a compliment it is. I heard of a guy who actually thought, I mean, he said, he thought that three quarters of the movie was a masterpiece, and the last quarter, after it finished, he went outside and he started kicking things. <laughs> you know? It is interesting from a storytelling point of view, too, and it was to us in the, I mean, what Ethan was saying about the sort of, it being, it's sort of conforming to the sort of ideas in the book and the sort of capricious nature of the, of the, of the, of the world and, um, and how the story sort of reflects that and that shift reflects that is sort of what was interesting to us. But in addition to that, it's an interesting, it was interesting to us in reading the book that you do follow the movie through, or you follow the novel through, because it's much the same in the novel and the movie, um, with following this one character and sort of investing in this character, and you believe the movie is about this character, and, and the outcome is going to take a, a trajectory that you're more or less familiar with. And Cormac, you know, he, 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 he changes that three quarters of the way through. And what he does is he makes you then sort of think, well, if it's not what I thought it was about, what is it about? Um, and I think that's what the last third of the story in the novel sort of tells you. And that's what we were trying to do in the movie as well. Who's hunting Shigur at, at the end? It looks like he, he breaks the economy with the, the coin toss, and because of that, he pays by getting in a car wreck. Is it fate? Is it God? Is it nat physical law? Well, that's another interesting thing in the book that you know, Cormac McCarthy kind of plays with. Is the guy larger than life or his personification of something? Is he other than human? And just when he has you sort of believing that maybe he is or maybe he represents something, he turns out to be, you know, he gets in a car wreck like any asshole would, you know? It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, you never feel at ease with him. You never feel like, you know, you, you never have the comfort of knowing exactly what you're dealing with. Um, it's, it's also connected to the other. I mean, it's many things, but I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of, it's at least partly that. Your, it contributes to your lack of ease with the character. I would uh, posit that the sheriff is the actual protagonist, because we start with his voiceover about uh, about his lineage of being in law enforcement, and then we end with his dream about his father preparing a place for him. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I think it's Moss that instigates the whole thing, you know? Well, sure, you got to say make that. It's about, it's I about Moss. I want to make that really clear. It's about Llewellyn Moss. There's, there's one lead part, and there's many supporting parts. Uh, okay? Yes, the woman. <laughs> Get that straight. <laughs> Fabulous job of translating the text. And 
And I wanted to talk about working with Cormac during the making and maybe um, during pre-production of the film. His involvement. He, he wasn't involved. We met him a couple of times, but during the shooting of the movie, he came by for an hour or two, a couple of times, when, because he, he actually he lives near where we were shooting the movie. But um, um, he, he wasn't, he, I don't think he had any interest in being involved in the movie. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Javier and Joel. I need to just talk about how you came up with the characterization for um, Shigur, just in general. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I guess it was based on the haircut, and they did that to me, and I have to live with that. And I thought it was a good idea, and beyond, from there, I, I personally tried to build a character below that haircut, <laughs> uh, which was not easy, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm lost. <laughs> Can you help me? <laughs> it's like being back on set. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Um, <laughs> um, so we'll go all the way in the back. You in the back there. Yes, you. Um, well, I admire this movie enormously. I, I wonder why it's the my world aunt. that is so violent and so creatures the question is, why did you make a movie that feels like our lives? I don't know. You want to take that one, Ethan? I don't think this movie's hopeless at all. Personally, I, I, I think that um, uh, Ed Tom Bell's uh, recounting of his dreams at the end of the movie um, and, uh, and, and the uh, dream that he has that his father will make a nice home for him. Yes, it's... It, and, and, um, if he can endure the cold and the dark, he'll eventually come to a place where his um, father has made a warm place. Um, it, um, is a ray of hope. The last thing he says is, and then I woke up. That's the end of the movie. Um, so the, the, the last element of this um, contemplation of uh, mor morality deals with the idea of hope and um, acknowledges that it's a dream and raises the question of how real is a dream? Is a dream a falsehood, or to what extent can a dream be a reality? Um, I, I think in Cormac's world, the, the best questions are far better than the, any answer. Um, I don't think it's a hopeless movie I, at all, and I, I, don't, I don't think it... I don't think Joel and Ethan had anything to say about hopelessness. I think in their faithful representation of Cormac's work, um, they would, they'd like to put the possibility of hope in, before you for your own choosing. I think that's it. It's a good way to end. Uh, thank you all. This is uh, really great. It's a, I think it's just a fantastic movie. Yeah.